Um, if you remember, uh, we really like Full of, Full of Eyes, which is the guy who made the picture on here. He has a website. Um, this one's from Romans 5.16, uh, which we'll be reading today. But this is a really cool picture that uh, we like to have when we include these. Uh, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to read a little bit. So pray with me. Our Father and our God, as we look through your word today, open up our hearts and minds to the understanding that only you can give us, that Romans lays out for us on how to follow you better, how to live for you on this campus, and reach those around us with your love and your compassion for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, just to recap, uh, Romans is a, a PhD resistance for uh, Paul. He is trying to get every single thing in order. And he goes through and explains how we are saved, when we are saved, what do we do about it. It's got some themes. It's got the gospel in it. I talked about Romans Road the first week. You could literally just go through and read Romans to people and evangelize them to them that way. It would be very simple. Maybe a little boring for some people, but very simple. It's got righteousness. It talks about the relationships between Jews and Gentiles. It talks about justification. It talks about Christian living. It talks about Christian liberty. Uh, we could go on, right? Um, we're going through it this semester because when we go through a book like this, I want to teach you to think not in the, the view of chapters and headings, but the whole book is laid out for you to use. And it's laid out as one letter to a people from one all the way through the end of Romans for your empowerment as Christians to live a Christian life. So let's get through a summary right here. Chapter one, Paul visits Rome. Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. No one is righteous. Chapter two was, yes, no one means both Jews and Gentiles. No one is righteous. Don't be hypocrites. God is, not impartial, or God is impartial. He is not partial to you. He's not partial to a certain thing. Righteousness is available apart from the law. You are not going to do it by keeping some standard, by being good enough. Uh, it doesn't matter if you had the law or not. You ain't going to make it. Okay? NGMI. You're not going to make it. The object of your faith is far more important than the strength of that faith. So Blasi hit on a lot last week. You believing in God does not make God more powerful. This is not like... Um, if you ever played a video game with religion in it, sometimes this exists, where the more they believe in the God, the God is the strongest God. That's not how this works. If you believe in God even a little bit, he's still faithful. If you believe in God a whole lot, he's still faithful. He doesn't change, right? It's you that changes. It's you that have the functional change of heart, change of understanding. It's you that it gets worked on, all right? So chapter five, we ain't got there yet, all right? I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to read the first half of Romans five here. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. And hope does not put to shame, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still weak at the time Christ died for the ungodly, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. These are the words of God, right? You've been justified by faith. Every time you see therefore, your ears should perk up. He's making a, a, a statement based on everything we just read. So that means if you didn't read chapter 4 or chapter 3 or chapter 2 or chapter 1, you're going to be a little lost, right? That's why we did the recap. Therefore, you have been justified by faith. You believe that Jesus can save you. You believe that by his grace, he does save you. And what are you supposed to do about it? Your introduction into this is supposed to lead you into boasting. That we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Why? Right? Isn't boasting bad? If we're talking about justified by faith, right? We talk about boasting, we can think of like James here that says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there and engage in business and make profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Said you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. 
Therefore, to the one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. That makes boasting sound bad, but it's a specific type of boasting, right? It's walking around thinking like you're going to make everything happen. You're the big shot. You're, you're going to walk into the town and everyone's going to love you. Uh, you're worthy of everything. You act as if you know what's going to happen and you don't. God's the one in charge. Well, what about boasting from Corinthians, right? Uh, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that we be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing, so I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is jo the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers. They may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in the favor against one another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you do not receive? If you've received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Right? If we receive something, why do we get to boast about it? If you got a really cool gift for Christmas, do you get to boast on how you earned it or you, how you got it or because your parents are filthy rich? No. You didn't do anything. You didn't earn it. So why am I saying boasting? And it's because when he's encouraging us to boast here, he's encouraging you to boast because you suck. He's actually encouraging you to boast because you aren't good enough. Because you actually have afflictions. Because these afflictions that have come upon you, these things that have shown that you're insufficient, actually show how good God is. That it didn't take you cleaning yourself up first. It didn't take you setting your course right. It didn't take you doing the right things for God to love you. So to keep me from being conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamity. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is something we need to take away from Romans, because I don't think you really think about it when you think about Romans. That at the end of the day, you should be a walking around boasting machine of how insufficient you are to be chosen by God. Because if, of all the places you got around here, that's the thing that's going to make you stand out the most against everybody else. Is that you don't think you're high and mighty. You don't think you're doing awesome. You don't think that you're great. That the conceitedness of many people doesn't fall on you because you realize that you can be content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. That can be hard for a lot of us. To realize that we're actually supposed to be acknowledging our sinfulness, acknowledging that we're bad, acknowledging that we need help. How many people here are like asking for help? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's rough, isn't it? It's rough asking for help. On homework, I know some of you have talked to me about your grades, and I've suggested you go to somebody else in this room for those, and you didn't do it. I don't know what to tell you. If, if you're not going to use the resources around you, if you're not going to use the resources that people have given you, the gifts that are around you, realize that you are shunning that gift. That the affliction that God has given you, that maybe you having bad grades so that you, you know, lower yourself a little bit is good for you. Maybe you having a, a, a really bad argument with your roommate is good for you. Maybe having a really, a really bad day where you like, you just feel like garbage all day because of your hair, because of your, something that happened in your family, because whatever it is, is actually meant to take you somewhere. It's actually meant to make you walk forward and learn something. Because you're supposed to boast in the fact that you did not deserve it or earn it, and God's going to help you anyway. This affliction is supposed to lead to something, right? So we go back here. Actually, it might be the next slide. I might have been smart. Yeah, hey. Um, affliction brings about perseverance, right? Why would affliction bring about perseverance? I got two military guys in here, right? Both of you have drills and wonderful things that you get to do, right? How many people drop out? Give me a percentage, first years. 33, right? You guys were all freshmen once. You had friends here that aren't here anymore. How many people drop out of the school? Quite a bit, huh? Why? 
because it's hard. Because this isn't, this isn't a playground. You, if you screw around enough, you get bit, right? Why does perseverance do, have anything to do with affliction? Because when you've seen something tried and tested, when you see something worked, when you see a friend go through something, guess what you think about them afterwards? They've persevered, they've overcome, and you have hope for them, right? You function the same way, right? It, when you try to overcome things in your own life, when you have to deal with things in your own life, whether it be failing a class, whether it be or a harsh breakup, whether it be bad friendships, whatever it may be, when you get out of it, you finally get hope. There's a little, a little bit of a line here that affliction brings about perseverance. Perseverance brings about character because it changes you. And that character actually brings about hope because now you see that something can change. How many of you change just because you feel like it? Yeah, right? If we, if like, you, you know people that have said they want to go to the gym for like, I don't know, 10 years? Right? People that said they were going to stop doing this thing, stop, wa stop binge watching Barney or whatever they binge watch, Bluey, whatever is on now. I don't know what you guys watch nowadays. I know the thing that when I was a student was The Office. Like I knew people, I know, I know one, one guy that literally watched The Office more than I went to class. Uh, it was like a full-time job. <laughs> hey, you. <laughs> I went to class. <laughs> and and so, like, I, I want you to realize something about, uh, about how, like, when people want to change, when we want to see change with people, it often takes these hardships. And you have to realize that God actually gives, us to these, to, gives them to us intentionally. And why on earth would he do that? Why would he need you to be weak? Why would he want you to be weak? Shouldn't we be the strongest? Right? Shouldn't we be the biggest? Shouldn't we be the best? We have God on our side, right? So it's something we talk about when we talk about uh, like assurance of salvation, that you shouldn't be afraid of things because you have everything in the entire universe. You have God behind you. Well, that's because when we look at things like what Paul said here, we realize that it is actually because we aren't good enough on our own is the only way we will turn to God. If you think you can walk away tomorrow from anything, if you think you're indestructible, you're going to try doing dumb things like jumping off the meme. Right? I can see it on your faces. I saw laughs. I see, I see excited faces. If you, th if you actually thought you were indestructible, how many people are jumping off the meat? Probably all of you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, because this is what happens. We get prideful and we get arrogant. It may be unintentional, but this is what we do. And it's not a surprise to God. If you woke up today expecting perfection, you should have gone back to bed. You are not made for perfection. You're not going to do it perfectly. You're not going to get the, the absolute perfect outcome for everything you do. Faithfully serving God means that when you sin, you repent. God expects you to sin and then repent when you sin. He doesn't expect you to go through today without sinning. That's the faithful part. The faithful part is actually doing the things that he's set up. Like when he gave us the laws and said, this is, when you, this is the law of the laws you're going to break, and then this is what you do afterwards. You kind of get to the idea, oh, he had contingency for us. He knew what we were going to do. He knew what we're prone to do. All the struggles you've had, all the, the things you've had to overcome were actually for you to be strengthened because they make character. Something we hit on last semester was the fact that character is one of the things that we see throughout the Bible as being shaped every single story. We have Abraham in the beginning that goes from a guy who is saying that his wife is his sister so he doesn't get killed to the very end where he's uh, still screwing up by sleeping with his, hand, his, his wife's handmaid in order to fulfill the promise that he doesn't need to do. Yet all along the way, he's got these weird interactions with God where God is literally sending angels to talk to him, where he's pray, trying to convince God to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Not because he's good, but because this is actually supposed to build his character. Why does hope come, from, come last in, in this little spiel? Right? If, if we were going to we were gonna ask you what, what's first required for you to like, get something done, what would we probably say? Hope, dream, vision, something of those words, right? If you were going to imagine you were like, really good at school, you'd have to imagine it first before you go do it. You probably wouldn't apply yourself first, right? If you can't see it happening, you're not going to do it. Just kind of how we function again. 
Wouldn't you and I like to put first hope and then have it come to pass and then get the other things? Like if we hope and then maybe we'll struggle for it? And something I want you to realize is God places it in the opposite order. That the last thing you're going to do is finally have hope because you've went through the struggle and went through the pain. In dealing with people, we always look at uh, each other with kind of tinges of doubt, right? Um, I, 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 you, when you make a new friend, right? You kind of have to learn to trust them with information. You don't, some, some of you are golden retrievers like me and you really don't care and you'll just say anything and do whatever, right? You'll go with the, the brand new freshman that you just met and you'll go cliff jumping someplace you've never been and one of you's gonna end up in the hospital and that's okay. But for most of you, you, in order to build relationships, you have to sit and watch someone act and how they do and see what they end up doing so you can build that relationship. You spend time with them, right? If you're, <laughs> for some of you, you're not gonna take some random person who's like, oh yeah, I got that homework done, here, here you go. You're gonna be like, no, I think I'll try it on my own, right? Especially if you know anything about their grades, right? If they got a 3.0, you may be a little bit more, if they got a 4.0, you're like, oh yeah, for sure. But if they got a 2.7, you're like, mm, I can do better. And when we look at how we build relationships, we should see that that's exactly how this <laughs> lays out. This is, this is every one of your team projects, right? You were forced into a team, you have a problem, and either you kick someone off the team or they shape up or you figure something out and then you finally think this team's gonna work. I point this out because as Christians, the mindset should be that we are working through the affliction that God has given us to persevere and build the character to be whatever it is we're supposed to be prepared for in hopes of that God is working in us. And... Uh, I didn't put it on here, but I'm going to read this. Paul goes on to explain this very thing. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we can be reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Much more having been reconciled, we should be saved by his life. Not only this, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have now received recon reconciliation. I think that's, I should have just put, it's 6 through 11 here, right? What did he say? He said Christ was a righteous man that people would not have died for. And they didn't. How many of the apostles also went to the cross with him that day? Nada, right? We had Peter who tried right? Denied him three times. We have the, the strange story in Mark where there's the, the man who only has a sheet who then gets caught and run away naked. But the apostles weren't necessarily a bunch that was trying to actually die for Christ. Yet God's demonstrated his love, his kindness, his grace through suffering and affliction that you have documented in the book in front of you, that God has proven his character to you through each one of those books, so that you have a hope that he can save you. See, he does it too, just to prove the point. He has structured this in the same way so that you can understand that the hope we have, that, that we get to boast in, was through the exact same channels. So, reading a little bit more. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the trespass of Adam, who was a type of him to come. But the gracious gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. And the gift is not like the one which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the gracious gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of the gra grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, 
Even so, through one act of righteousness, there result the justification of life to all men. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, many will be appointed righteous. So the law came in, so the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, that's the word of God you have right in front of you. We have another therefore, right? Therefore, so it should stick up. He's trying to explain what he just said again. And he's saying that sin entered in like a seeker missile. And it seeks to destroy you. It's, it's hot wired to hit your DNA and it wants to reign over you. It is waiting for every possibility. Genesis will say it's creeping around like a lion to devour you. Any way it can enter into your life, it wants to. It affects us all. None of us can escape from it. Yet, the gift is not like this. The gift is Jesus died and now purifies all those that come before him and admit they are weak. This whole section wants to illuminate the fact that you should be boasting in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and you should be boasting that you aren't good enough. You should be excited that you're not strong enough or smart enough. Because it's what makes it available to you. That you're humble enough to recognize this pig flaw. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were appointed sinners, so through the obedience of one, many would be appointed righteous. This is available to people. This is the good news, that they can have righteousness. Right, I think we're clear now. Any questions? So, the, the, um, the trial, perseverance, and character, hope? Yes. Is that, is that like on a case-by-case basis, or is that like life time? Or both? So the question, for sake of the recording, the trials, perseverance, character, hope, situation, is that a case-by-case case or a lifelong? I think I'm going to give you the easy answer, which is maybe not very, not easy, but simple, but maybe unhelpful at first, is it's both. There's, oh man, it's a beautiful cactus. <laughs> Goodbye, cactus. So the idea with perseverance producing character, or was it? It's Perseverance producing. Uh, yeah, can't think and erase at the same time. What's the order? All right, so we have tribulation, persevere, persevere, it's probably spelled wrong, perseverance, character, and hope. So the idea here is that on a case-by-case -case basis, you go through this, these, I don't know if you can see that, through these little pockets where you kind of have this arc of each thing which over the course of your life will develop in you like a stronger faith and more hope. Because the hope is also not just this vague hope. Uh, you can think of other spots in Scripture. Hebrews 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope is not just this ethereal wishing for things to happen, as much as it is a firm and well thought out and reasoned belief that something is going to happen. Uh, we have hope that Christ will return. We have hope that he will finish what he started. We have hope that we will make it through. We have hope we will be made more righteous. And when we first start out, we don't have a lot of that. We don't have a whole lot of hope at first. Because similarly, I think Char mentioned something about it. You meet somebody new, you maybe don't have a whole lot of trust or faith between the two of you. But as you get to know somebody, as you get to do this, as you get to do that, your level of hope or trust with this person continues to grow. Uh, one thing with me is with like a car. You get a used car, you kind of got to ease into it. You're not sure, but eventually you get to a point where you know all the things that are wrong with your car and you justify why you don't fix different things and you justify why this sound is okay. And, and then you're comfortable driving some beater across the entire state and you don't think anything of it, but you wouldn't pay two cents for that beater off the lot and then drive it home unless you absolutely had to. So it's this, 
these individual things which we have tribulation and hope and more grows and more grows that over the course of our lives we continue to have more and more faith and trust God more and more. If you've ever talked to someone who's been following God faithfully for like 80 years, you kind of get this idea. You talk to someone who's been walking with God for a long time, there ain't nothing that's going to happen that's going to throw that person off. It's going to shatter his world. He or she knows God, is known by God, and has gone through so much tribulation and has persevered through so much to build the character that has the faith that is really the substance of the hope that we have in Christ and what he's going to accomplish. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts on that topic? The only thing I'll add is I really like the definition of hope being longing for what you know will come. Um, for Christian hope is, is you know it's there and you long for it and you almost yearn for it more and more as you, you grow your faith. Yeah, we're not wishing for it. It's like you order something before you had tracking. <laughs> it's going to be here. Six to eight weeks. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Good. Any other questions? Comments, thoughts, conundrums? Yes, Elijah. So when you say boasting in our own like insufficiency or weakness, how does that align with um, it was and we boast in the hope of the glory of God and then we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus? Yeah, so there's, there's a, a few different things, for, again, for the recording. So we boast in our afflictions, we boast in the hope of the glory of God, and we boast in, what was the third one? I'm trying to remember. It's hope in the glory of God. I, th I think you put the two together. And in God. Yeah. So uh, those things work together. They're different facets of the um, kind of boasting that believers are supposed to do. It's still going to hear it. Your sneeze is... It's going away. I'm just making a fool. <laughs> you need to sneeze so loud, they ask what happened in North, at Northern. Okay, I guess. <laughs> so the sneeze went away. Nonetheless, so what are these different hopes? Well, we hope in our affliction, or we, not hope, we boast, these different boasts. We boast in our affliction. I think of that, what comes to mind is in Acts, where the, I think it's chapter 5, where the apostles considered themselves, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer for the gospel of Christ. Like there is a privilege in suffering for the truth. There's a privilege in facing these tribulation and having to persevere and building character and hope because we know what it's producing, so we're glad that God is bringing that to us. Now, one thing you can think of is that our trials and tribulations, the sufferings of this life, are conduits for God's glory. That when we say, Everything God does is for our good and for his glory. It's always both of those things. There's nothing that's for our good that's not for God's glory, and there's nothing that's for God's glory that's not for our good. So when we face trials, when we face sufferings, when God sovereignly brings things to bear upon our lives, we can boast in those things, not in glorifying the affliction as much as glorifying the outcome, knowing, again, the hope that we have that God's doing something through it. We boast in the hope of the glory of God is kind of wrapped in that as well, where we understand that I know all this is going on. I think of Corinthians for the suffering in this present world is not worth being compared to the glory that is being prepared for us. That there's an affliction that we face that's not worth comparing to the glory we receive at the end. It's kind of the idea of what we're paying this is a weird analogy. What we're paying in our suffering in the present age is not worth comparing to what we get beyond this life. Another way of putting that, like, if you were able to buy a car brand new for a nickel, you'd be telling everybody that you got a brand new car for a nickel. It'd be, oh, cool, yeah, I got this. I mean, without getting in the line of like becoming arrogant and bragging about it, but it's a fun story. I bought a car for a nickel that's really nice. Similar idea that Paul's getting at. We boast in the hope of the glory of God because the things we go through now, because we're trusting in who God is, is not worth comparing to the actual value that is being prepared for us at the end. And then the third thing, boasting in God, is just giving God glory for what he's accomplished. Uh, the church that I grew up in, there were people who's out. We, sometimes people give testimonies or whatever. They all brag on God. Brag on God. It's like, tell people about what God's doing in your life. Like, that's what we do whenever we've done sharing meetings or whenever you're 
encouraging one another with what God has done. When you're hearing stories of what people have gone through and how God has been faithful, it's like, let's really talk God up. Like he's not some weak, impotent deity who can't accomplish anything. He's a majestic, all-powerful savior who does many things, who sustains the universe. And we can, we can boast about that. It's like, you know, my dad's faster than your dad. Well, my God's better than your God. Like, <laughs> that's what it comes down to. Just to add on to that, um, sorry, are you done? Yeah, no, it's, just go for it. Uh, I'm just giving you credit. Okay, this is a really good quote I like. Uh, he who learns must suffer, and even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. And in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. His name is Ascalias. Um, he died because a bird dropped a tortoise on his head because he was bald and thought it was a strong enough rock to crack a tortoise, you know, birds that, yeah, that's how he died. Um, he, was, he, was, he was known for his uh, tragedy and, and writing and suffering and about different things that, he, that you have to suffer through in life. And I think that captures what you're, when we're talking about boasting and weakness is, I mean, real, realizing that the pain and stuff is worth, he uses the term awful grace of God. Um, that, that's what it feels like. If we're going to be real. Other times people call it dark providence. Dark providence. Something like that. That this, you're learning here, you, you learning at Michigan Tech, it's an awful grace of God. Yes, Eric. Verse 14. Let me see your, your Bible. Bottom right. Restate the question. All right. So the question is, why in verse 14 is Adam considered a type of him who was to come? So Specifically in the context of Adam's sin, right? Why are those two things sure. juxtaposed? Uh, they're juxtaposed. So I'll read the verse. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the trespass of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So, Adam is a, he prefigures Christ, is what this is talking about. Adam could have done something different in the garden, but he didn't. And Christ is the fulfillment of what Adam should have done. So, in the garden, we have, things are made perfect. Adam is in charge of the garden, dominion, everything. He's supposed to... Keep the garden, protect it, keep it safe. He's supposed to protect Eve, keep her safe. And he doesn't. The snake shows up, and first thing Adam should have done is kill the snake. That was the first thing. Uh, kill the snake before it could deceive his wife. Uh, we know he's standing there the whole time doing nothing because it says that after she ate, she handed it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Um, so... Adam's standing by doing nothing while the snake is talking to his wife, while the snake is tempting Eve, and he doesn't stop that. So option one, kill the snake before Eve eats. Option number two, kill the snake after Eve eats and go to God on her behalf. Um, because you'll notice that the fall doesn't happen until Adam eats. Eve eats of the fruit. Adam still has a choice that he can make. He could have gone to God and say, I failed at protecting my wife from the snake. I took care of the snake. She still did the thing she wasn't supposed to. Take me instead. That didn't happen. So what does he do? He eats the apple. He has this sort of like forlorn lover thing of this Romeo and Juliet, oh, if I can't live with her, I'll die with her sort of thing that he gets caught up on. He eats. Then they realize that they're naked. Then sin enters the world. Then we have all this stuff going on. All this, uh, another thing you could look at if you want to look into this a lot deeper is something called federal headship, that a in Adam all sinned. Uh, Brandon mentioned that it's not, we don't struggle with sin because we sinned at one point and then we struggle with sin. We struggle with sin because Adam sinned and we're born into this world already in a fallen state. We talked about this with uh, Pelagianism. You talked about this with Pelagianism <laughs> last semester with we're not born naturally good and we're okay until we sin. We are born naturally against God, and we need to be redeemed from the start. So Adam didn't do those things. So he is, Adam was a type of him who was to come. Adam represented all of humanity and failed in representing all of humanity well. 
Jesus shows up on the scene. He has a bride who is, did not do what she was supposed to. There's a snake that's been in this world. What does Jesus do? He remains perfect. He does not commit sin. He goes to God on behalf of his bride, the church, offers himself up to take the punishment that she deserved, thus redeeming his bride from the punishment required from sinning and from uh, breaking God's laws. So we see that Christ fulfills everything that Adam was supposed to have done. Jesus kills the serpent. He crushes the serpent's head. He redeems his bride. He goes before God on her behalf and redeems all of creation. So that's what's going on with Adam being related as a type of Christ in the context of Adam having sinned is not Adam sinned as a type of what Christ was going to do, but that Adam was fulfilling a role that is indicative of what Christ is going to do. And Adam failed, but Christ does not. Make sense? Any questions there? I know that was, that was a lot. Okay, cool. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Anyone else wearing a blue sweatshirt wants to ask a question? You didn't get any text messages with questions, right, with all no, your messages? It only dings for my wife. Oh, okay. So she says, how's the meeting? meeting -y. Charb says meaty. <laughs> so I asked you some very pointed questions. And that's because I want to get down to something. What does boasting to someone for not being good enough even look like? What does that mean? Right? Well, one of the things I would categorize is, when's the last time you asked someone for help on your homework? When's the last time you acknowledged to someone else that you can't do it alone? When's the last time you acknowledged someone that you needed help with something? When's the last time you let someone pay for your rent, pay for your, your insurance, cover something for you in any way, shape, or form, right? When's the last time? When's the last time you let someone help you with uh, even like fixing your car? Because in reality, that second question is acknowledging that you have to be humble enough to let God do anything. Otherwise, he's going to use a two-by-four to accomplish his goals. And so this kind of setup is trying to get you to realize that you sitting together with other people and boasting to one another and encouraging one another is going to look a lot like asking for prayer requests. It's going to look a lot like going to someone even in confidence and saying, I don't know how to deal with this. It's going to look a lot like saying, I don't know. Or it's going to look like, a lot like point four, which is actually telling someone you forgive them for something that you don't want to. Because that's the other way that this gets dragged through the mud, is refusing to give people forgiveness. Is refusing to acknowledge that we had to accept forgiveness, and we have to give it to. This is another picture. I really like this one, too. This is Romans 5.23, I think. I don't... Is, okay, so I don't, I don't remember. It's something 23, so it may be 6. I don't, I don't remember. Or I could, have a, I could have it completely wrong. It was a really cool picture. Again, full of eyes. But the sin that was imputed into the world has been replaced with the righteousness that can be obtained through Christ. And that righteousness outmaneuvers, outplays, out overpowers, overcomes every sin in this world. There is not a grace that is not strong enough to overcome sin. There is not a grace that is, is weak, is, is insufficient. His grace is always sufficient. And if you can go grab onto that, if you can latch onto the fact that it doesn't matter if you're sufficient in your own, you will do well. You will find that he is sufficient. But it's only available to those who acknowledge that they're weak. It's only available to you who acknowledge that you need God. And so your charge this week and next, since we don't meet, is to show the people around you that you need Christ, that you need Christ's righteousness, that you can't do it on your own. Because the only way you're going to be strong is you, have, you acknowledge that before God and man. I want you to be faithful even in the face of the challenges that come. Spring break, traveling, whatever it may be, family, friends. I really don't care. 
but I want you to see that you're going to have necessary things to do. You're going to have struggles within relationships. You're going to have struggles within friendships. You're going to have struggles within family. You're going to have traveling woes. You're going to have grade woes. I'm sure you all are going to have a second exam or a third exam this week that is driving you mad. You're going to be mad at a teacher. You're going to complain about grades. You're going to complain about having to go to class. You're going to find anything you can to say it's someone else's fault other than acknowledging that you need Christ in your week. That's your charge this next couple of weeks. Because that, and the forgiveness that comes with it, we don't deserve, but it sets you free. Pray with me, please.